Welcome to LLT 180, Hero Inquest. In our last class, we were taking the case, taking up the case of Antigone, an individual, just a girl in the world, who is just trying to do what's right. When we put it on the public affairs o meter, which I just invented, um, this is a young woman named Antigone and she's not happy. <laughs> Everybody's an art critic. There we go. Nor should she be because Antigone knows the right thing to do. Keep in mind that she is going to be um, her brother Polynices is dead. Her brother Ateocles is dead. Her mom is her grandma. Her dad is her brother. She's got a whole lot of hurt going on. Her uncle, Creon, who is now the king, says, bury the great patriotic hero, Ateocles, who died fighting for his country with all great honor. Leave Polynices out to rot and be the dinner of dogs and birds and airplanes and stuff like that. Just let them rot. Thereby ensuring that his soul will know no peace in the afterlife. So this is not good. And when I say Antigone is just a girl, I say that, and today is International Women's Day, um, just the girl in the world is, this is a patriarchal society. Even if she is the nearest living descendant of King Oedipus and Queen Jocasta, she cannot be the ruler because she is female. You know, she's supposed to just shut up, get married, and have lots of babies. God bless you. Um, God bless us each and every one. No, I, I'm sorry. I lost my... Oh! Okay, that's it. She is just a person who isn't even enfranchised. She doesn't even get to speak in public. She should just shut up and have babies. But she decides to do the right thing. And that's why, folks, that's why I really do believe that this play really does give a good idea of what the public affairs mission is about. In this case, it's community involvement. Okay, she's going to break in the law in order to bury the soul of her, the body of her deceased brother. But she's actually throwing down the gauntlet. She is saying, Creon, your leadership is not ethical. You are ordering that Polynices be left to rot so you can just cover your own tail, your own A55, so that you can keep being the king of Thebes. Antigone says that I've got the cultural competence thing going. I know my dad was my brother and my mom was my grandmother and all of that. I know I've got all this bad juju going on in my family. I know I'm just a mere girl, but I also know that it is not right that my brother Polynice should be left out there to rot. And I don't care if you threaten me with death, Creon. I'm going to do the right thing. Now, go ahead. Well, and that's the thing. I, we're going to get to Virgil's Aeneid in not too long of a time from now. And, I mean, as I said on camera last time, and you could actually put this down on a test, reading the Aeneid in translation is like wandering in the desert without food and water for two weeks, two and a half weeks, and then being offered a box of soda crackers. It's that much unfun to read. It's worth reading in Latin. It's worth learning Latin to read. It really is. There's a class for that. It's called Latin. But my point is, the play Antigone was not just a book that literate people could read. The play Antigone was put on in a dramatic festival of Dionysus in this big, huge theater where just about anybody who wanted to could come and see it produced, could come and see 
the story of the young woman who decided that she was going to defy the king and say there's a higher law than something a mere mortal comes up with. It, there's a natural law that says that I, Antigone, am, in, am um, responsible, there you go, for burying, making sure both of my brothers are buried, and even if it costs me my life. Okay? That's one big thing I'd get out of it. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Janet. You said that her mom is her grandma and her dad is her brother. How does that work? <laughs> um, listen to the story about a man named Ed. He's supposed to kill his dad and take his mom to bed. Early one... <laughs> this is a reason why old, fat, bald, white guy should not rap, okay? Okay, okay. Very briefly. These two are married. He's the king of Thebes. She's the queen of Thebes. They're trying to produce a kid because it's important for the king and the queen to produce an heir to the throne so they don't have a stupid civil war like that one. But the Delphic Oracle, which is always right, says, you will have a child. He will grow up to kill his dad and marry his mother. This kid grew up to be Oedipus. I told the story on camera elsewhere. Basically, Oedipus grows up thinking, hey, I'm the son of King Polybus and Queen Merope of ancient Corinth, until one day somebody calls him a bastard. Eddie, <laughs> you bastard. And he says, no, I'm not a bastard. <laughs> you are too. Oedipus goes to the Delphic Oracle and asks a perfectly sane question. Am I the son of King Polybus and Queen Merope of the ancient Greek city of Corinth? With me so far? This is what he wants the answer to. And he gets the following answer. You will kill your father and you will marry your mother. I ask you, Janet, what the hell kind of an answer is that? Is that a good answer? Really? I'm... Is it the answer to his question? At least then he knows who his father is. He doesn't know who his father is. The next guy you kill will be your dad. You great humanitarian, Jackson. Um, how can you just say no? We did that whole thing where we're driving in traffic, right? And, you know, the love of your life, Johnny Depp, right? Or who was it? Okay, pick one. Okay, you can share. You, and you're in a car driving together to go down and hook up with these two hot-looking guys. And, you know, they're going to stay there until 5.30 p.m., right? And here's this old clod in a blue Volkswagen. And I stop at every yellow light on the way there. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm weaving in between because I'm half asleep. I'm texting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get up, turn off, and go get up. Check it out. But my point is, you know, when you're stopped at the yellow light in front of Battlefield Mall, you're trying to get down to Outback to find <laughs> David Beckham, Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum, okay, whoever these people are. Um, you'd be tempted, wouldn't you? to pull the axe out and go after the guy, the old dork in the blue Volkswagen? I rest my case. Let's hear some love for me for having a great teaching moment. Come on, give me the... No. No, no, no. You'd kill him. You'd kill him, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Okay, here's another one. Um... Gee, I know I'm forecast to marry my father, but he looks like David Beckham, and he's nowhere near as old enough to be my father. What do you do? There's no way on earth that that prime hu male human person dude, Mano American Brit there, burp. You know, I'm get to, I get to marry him. Ooh, you know, 
Do you think, well, no, I can't even say that. Do you think with this or do you think with something farther south, okay? Uh, do, this is what Oedipus did. But that's not what it... Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, if you take the letter M and then you put in a vowel and then you take... The... Yeah, exactly, they exist. They've existed all through time. And so they mingle in love. And they have Polynices, Eteocles, Izzy, and Tiggy. So there you go. I mean, if anybody in the world could have just been tempted to say, to heck with this, I'm out of here, it would be Antigone. She did the ethical thing, she did the right thing, she did the best thing she could. And I'm sticking to it. That's what impresses me about her. With regard to your question, Taylor, which I did not surprisingly forget about. Creon starts out being a bad guy. Creon decides that he is going to condemn Antigone to death. Antigone says, fine, kill me. You know, I'm doing the right thing. He decides to relent, not have her executed. He sends her down into a tomb under the ground, okay, where she is not allowed to come back up. This is an instance of so-called plausible deniability. Um, Crayon can say, I didn't kill her. I just made her go down into that cave there. She could kill herself if she wanted to. She could die of starvation if she wanted to. She could bang her head up against the wall until she died. Doesn't matter, because then I didn't kill her. That, of course, is a bunch of poop, okay? And what I would suggest is that Antigone's descent into the tomb, complete with the chorus, talking with her as she goes down there said well I guess I'm gonna marry death and they're saying oh this is really sad Antigone and then they sing a few more things that nobody can make any sense out of because they're the chorus and that's what they do but she's going down there maybe we're hoping against hope that somebody will come to their senses you know she's going down she has the liminal experience as she enters the cave door. I mean, a cave in the ground that you have to go down to, that's about as symbolic an underworld as you can get to. It would be kind of neat if she could go down there and think, well, you know, maybe I should have just explained to Creon more politely by saying, I'm your female that I am, would like to suggest to your kingliness, or whatever one learns on a catabasis. And then Creon changes his mind. He sends his son Haman to go dig her out. And he opens the door and he goes, Antigone! She says, oh, I was just about to hang myself, but what did your dad say? Your, my dad said, you're free to go. He said, he's sorry. Oh, honey, this is so great. Let me tell you, I've learned so much from my near-death experience in the underworld. Let me tell you all about it. The end except for the play isn't going to end that way. One of the nice things about watching World War II documentaries is that Hitler invariably dies at the end, every single time. Antigone dies at the end of this play every single time. I would say that the trip down there is, in fact, a catabasis, that she doesn't come back from. And I've never seen this as presented as a play. I've never seen a movie of Antigone, but I can't see how it wouldn't be just incredibly moving to see the plucky young heroine who you're hoping is going to make it out against all odds get dragged up from the room dead. Her fiancé then kills himself. Her intended mother-in-law thereupon kills herself. 
I mean, it's like Romeo and Juliet, the great love story of our time, of all time, you know, and it ends up with them both dead. Jeez, up with people. Just proves my theory that, um, that tragedy consists of the story of people making life-changing decisions based on incomplete information that they're screwing, going to screw up anyway because they're only human. And the only thing for certain at the end is you're going to have to pay the price yourself. I pause for questions. Is that an okay answer? I was thinking of it more with that one more I'll take that. Um, why does Creon decide to change his mind and let Dean out, but even though she does end up paying herself, why did he change his mind? Well, at the risk of sounding like a flimp flopper, I don't, <laughs> I don't assume that every decision I make is automatically right. And I try to reflect that in my decision making by saying, okay, I will not execute the people who are not in class today. You know, I don't make these grand sweeping plans like, you know, everybody who says that um, the Beatles are better than Smiths, the Smiths should drop this class immediately and probably leave the state. Okay? Um, I don't make statements like that. I try to be more reasonable. But when Creon is the go-to man, and this city is just screwed up like nobody could believe. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, the first king wound up traveling the world as a snake for seven years. And his wife was turned into a snake too. And they just kind of like slithered around in their retirement, converting people to the religion of Dionysus. How weird is that? George Washington turned into a snake and slithered around Mexico trying to recruit. No, no, no. This, state, this city is just messed up like you wouldn't believe. And Creon is the guy in charge of trying to make things happen right. He doesn't get them all right all the time. So, yeah, I guess that's part of human lot too. Easy to sit back and judge. You know, maybe I shouldn't have become a teenage alcoholic. I would have had a higher grade point average and maybe gotten a scholarship to college and, invented the, and invested the money I spent on student loans in Walmart stock. There you go, Walmart stock. And then I could have reti been retired now and you could all be taking your afternoon nap. See what I mean? Any other questions? That was not a good answer, by the way. Oh, great, Sammy, go ahead. <laughs> Do we, well, of course, you are not going to probably have an answer for this, but I don't understand why she didn't wait, why Antigone didn't wait a little while. Is it, so this, she kills herself basically within a matter of hours of being shut in there. She's probably hungry. <laughs> <laughs> True, but so but also why she because she's while? look at it you, look at it from her viewpoint. Um, stop that. Um, she cannot possibly overestimate the buttheadedness of Creon. Is there a hawk out there? No, for the record, let me state that yesterday it was 71 degrees in Springfield, Missouri. 24 hours later, it's snowing. And let me also add that I haven't had a class do this to me since my first year at this fine university where I actually took the students outside. Forget it. It's not happening. I'm on camera. My hair. <laughs> I watched the whole class, their heads just went verp, verp, and I couldn't see what they were verping at, so I turned around and all I could see is, you know, two women walking down the sidewalk. And I said, all I saw was two women walking down the sidewalk, and then this kid said, well, yeah, but a second ago, they were kissing. <gasps> Lesbians. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not even possible lesbians or impossible <laughs> lesbians. We had a confirmed lesbian sighting. Oh, God, I know.
Oh, I forgive you, Sammy. Uh, it was snowing, huh? Stop. Yeah, it's still snowing. It's still snowing. Can you get a shot of that, Rich? <laughs> this guy is good. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Okay, that's enough. Somebody sing a Christmas carol or something like <laughs> Good King Effing Wenceslas or something like that. <laughs> Recess is over, kids. I'll fix you. It ends with the first words of Virgil's Aeneid. Arma virumqua cano qui primus Troiae boris. So anyway. <laughs> as opposed to, as opposed to the Antigone of Sophocles, which was a play put on in public, which everybody could see, everybody could watch, and I can guarantee you, everybody walked out of talking about it, okay? I can't imagine what I saw here. Can you believe that she died asking questions like, well, why didn't Antigone just wait it out? Or why is Creon such a butthead? Or, you know, what is it about that family? At least she didn't get stuck marrying some uncle dad or somebody like that. Cousin, Cousin dad. Um, <laughs> the the um, Antigone was a public dramatic performance which was intended really to give to entertain the audience and I really do believe to give the audience something to think about to ask questions about what is the best kind of leadership for a city what is ethical what is unethical was Creon being reasonable when he made that decree was he being unreasonable when he made that decree um, is Antigone applying cultural competence when she says there is a higher law than that of the king. It's called the law of nature, the law of Zeus that says, Antigone, you've got to bury your brother. There's the question of community involvement. When Antigone says, hey, Ismini, I'm going to bury Polynices. What do you think? Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> it's all in there. And it's all out there for all of the people of Athens to see. And then we get to the Aeneid of Virgil.